So welcome this morning to, to our homes, to, to my home. And uh, this is a great way to begin as we are in a new month. And so let's start with a word of prayer. And we're going to go into a wonderful hour that we have together in Jesus' name. So Father, I thank you. This day, this day as it's proclaimed is, is your day. This is the day that you, O oh God, have made. And the call is to rejoice in it and be glad. And I would pray in these days, Father, that we would learn a deep sense of joy that comes not from circumstances, for they will come and go, but a deep sense of joy that comes from understanding our position as children of God, who've been loved, who've been chosen, who've been called by you into a family, and uh, that we are called the that we are called your children. And so, God, I pray that the peace of God that transcends all understanding this morning would guard our hearts and would also guard our minds in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to start with just a call to worship with Here I Am to Worship, and the lyrics will be on the, the screen. And uh, if you care to, to sing in your living rooms with one another or by yourself, just let it go and enjoy a time of worship. <laughs> Of what 
piece would look like. I think we all have our ideas of what um, what peace should look like in our lives in these days. And some of us are thinking, if I could just get back to a sense of normalcy and rhythm and find some sort of structure to, to my days, then that would be my sense of peace. And I think we all have our idea of, of all these things that have changed, and yet there are certain things that haven't changed. And I came across an illustration, a, a story that, that I think depicts um, what our days look like today and, and our constant groping for a sense of normalcy. And, and maybe, I want to suggest that maybe we're barking up the wrong tree or we've put our ladder against the wrong building and, uh, and are trying to achieve something that, that can't be achieved apart from what God says about peace and what he offers to us in this time. And I, I want to play around with this theme a little bit this morning for us. And uh, this story I came across was an art contest that was held to find this perfect picture of what peace is. And so this challenge that went out stirred the arts community and, and the imagination of artists everywhere. And, and paintings begin to arrive from all over the world, far and wide. And finally, the great day of revelation when it was going to be revealed it came about and the field had been narrowed down to just two paintings. And as a judge pulled off the cover of the first one, a hush fell over the crowd. And a mere smooth lake reflected lacy green birches under the soft blush of an evening sky. And along grassy shore, a flock of sheep grazed undisturbed. I mean, surely this would be the winner of what a perfect picture of peace would be. But when the second painting was uncovered, there was a, an audible gasp of surprise by those who were looking. For the picture depicted a tumultuous waterfall cascading down a rocky precipice, and the crowd could almost feel the cold, penetrating spray. And in the backdrop, stormy gray clouds threatened to explode with lightning and wind and rain. And in the midst of the thundering noises and the bitter chill, a spindly tree clung to the rocks at the edge of the fall. But in that tree, a little bird had built his nest Content and undisturbed in her stormy surroundings, she rested on her eggs. And with her eyes closed and her wings ready to cover her little ones, she manifested peace that transcends all the earthly turmoil that was around her. And, and I like this story because I really believe it depicts today uh, often how guilty we are of searching for peace in that first picture that is being described of just wanting to see these nice calm lake in a, in a grassy shoreline, et cetera. And the problem is, as we continue to try and strive for trying to find a place of peace like that, could it be that that doesn't exist? At least not in, in the sense of normal, does it? Real peace, the kind of peace that the second picture reveals is the one that's ready and available to us all the time because of our circumstances and our circumstances change all the time and it can feel rocky it can feel thunderous it can feel like like a cascading waterfall of pressure onto us but in the midst of all of that there is this tranquil setting of what god depicts throughout the scriptures and including psalm 46 of being still in the midst of the chaos. And I want you to hear Psalm 46 this morning, read from the, the lips of a young man by the name of Walter. And uh, Walter, if you want to get yourself ready for that, and uh, we'll put that up. And as Walter's reading, I'll bring up the, the Psalm 46 that you can hear along. And I want you to listen for that. Go ahead, Bonnie, you can put that up on the share screen. Be able to see Psalm 46 as as 
Walter reads along, but I want you to hear the depiction of the psalmist as he, in essence, paints this picture of chaos and yet tranquility amidst the circumstances. Go ahead, Walter. Unmute yourself or someone can help unmute him and away we go. Oh, oh, can I get okay? Um, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear through the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Through the waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where, where the most high dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are uh, uproar. Kingdoms fall. His, his lips, he lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars crease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exiled among the nations. I will be exiled among the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thank you, Walter. You can hear that. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God will be exalted no matter what. And so in the midst of our, our ever-changing circumstances, we gather this morning with that deep sense and knowledge of, of a peace that transcends, it goes beyond all our comprehension that we can and are not in the natural. But we know that we operate in what we see as the and know as the supernatural, where God presses in and is our comfort and our hope in time of, of need. I want to share a video with you um, that deals with this idea of what hasn't changed. Although everything has changed, what hasn't changed? And it's a, it's a primer for our ongoing worship this morning to recognize what hasn't changed amidst a a world of change from day to day.
Welcome again to Harbor View this day in May. And uh, I want to just bring to your attention just a few announcements. As uh, these in these days, where we're not keeping regular office hours. We, we can't go out and meet for coffee necessarily up close and, and a little bit more personal than we'd like to and we can't. Uh, it's a good time to reach out. And, and for those who are guests, um, feel free to reach out to me and my email there to bring it up on the screen. It's paul at, at harborviewchurch.com. And uh, I'd love to connect with you and uh, have an opportunity to talk. Obviously, my phone is always available as well. And uh, you get that number off of our website too at harborviewchurch.com. And in these days, uh, we continue to encourage you in our worship time together, worship through giving, and a giving through various means now. We don't pass the plate normally at Harbor View. There's a gift box that you can give your, your gifts to at the back of the church. But in these cases, we just invite you, if you want to drop a check in the mail, or if you want to go online to our church website, you can give through uh, online giving or uh, an email transfer. Works just fine as well. As we keep the lights on, we keep things functioning, pay the rent, all that kind of stuff that we need to as a church. We appreciate uh, what you can give in these days as well. Another exciting thing, I spoke to um, John Wason of Word to Life Theater Arts. And some of you know John. John is uh, a YWAM uh, missionary and has been in the greater Victoria area for well over a decade already. And uh, travels extensively all around the world with his uh, with his theater arts portraying uh, various books of the Bible. And I talked to John this week. We had actually planned for him to come and do a live presentation for us a couple of weeks ago. And of course, with the cancellation or rather suspension of our services uh, physically, um, we put John off uh, just for now. But when I talked to him, I said, John, what would it be like if you were to come and we could set up a online live version and you could give a theatrical uh your theatrical rendition of the book of colossians it's called proclaiming the kingdom and so he's agreed to that and uh coming to your houses and your places your living spaces this may 17th um john will be with us to to share his uh his rendition of colossians i'm looking forward to that We've been in this wonderful book for, for some time and uh, will be for about another four weeks or so before we transition into a next sermon series into our summer months. So I'm excited about sharing that with you as well. Um, thanks to uh, Walter, who's read for us Psalm 46, and I particularly appreciate the participation from many of our uh, members of our congregation and those who um have various gifts to offer and uh i'm very grateful that we have some in-house musicians as well besides um myself or even cam and, and uh, our regular worship teams and so this week we have a a beautiful number by one of our youth sarah Terleski. and sarah has a song that's one of her go-to worship songs that actually expresses really well um, perhaps we have this idea of how we want to see God bless us. But God chooses to use our circumstances. God chooses to use our tears and uh, other means to not only get our attention, but actually draw us closer into the heart of God. And sometimes he does that in ways that we're like, man, why did you have to do that? But I'm so glad you did. And so Sarah's going to play for us uh, and sing for us a wonderful song here. So this is one of my favorite worship songs. It's called Blessings by Laura Story. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace. Your healing comes through tears. 
week as she does a another tribute and has a, a special guest that's going to join her so by all means make sure we tap in next week to, to hear that we're into the book of colossians and we're deep into the book of colossians in the second half in chapter three and uh, again just to recap the book of colossians written to the young believers the church in the city of Colossae, a young man by the name of Epaphras who came to know the Lord through Paul's teaching went back to a city of Colossae and uh, began a church work there. And Paul is writing to encourage the church to understand the fundamentals and the importance of making the priority of who is who, and that is who is your salvation? Where is your hope put into? What is it put into? And uh, Paul reminds the Colossians that it's in the person of Jesus Christ. For the thinking of the day was salvation was going to come through the, the Roman world. For the Roman world who controlled the known world at the time, they were, um, had developed incredible commerce and uh, traveled with an incredible network of roads and the Pax Romana, which is the, the law of the land, which, which took in all the different surrounding areas and brought them under one uh, system of understanding and government that was flexible and allowed various nations to keep their identity within the greater Roman picture. And Paul is making sure to realize and recognize that the importance of who Jesus is as the sovereign God that all things were created through him, by him, and for him, the whole universe, and that Christ is all in all. And then that's kind of the first two chapters of, of Colossians. And then he goes into the latter two chapters of three and four and stressing the importance of relationship with Jesus and how it affects living in community. So it becomes very practical. If Christ is all, how does that affect us in our day-to-day, moment-by-moment, living out our salvation with one another? And that's where we want to go this morning. I'm excited about the message this morning. I love the practicality of it, and I trust that you'll have some takeaways as we do that this morning. So if you've got your Bibles with you, uh, I would uh, encourage you to keep it open before you. Colossians 3, we're going to be looking at 
We're in the middle of the chapter, verses 9 to 14 is where we'll put most of our focus on this morning. I'm going to read that before I do. I just want to pray again and ask God's blessing upon his word and the promise that it never returns void. It goes out, it strikes at us, it strikes where we need to have it strike. Dividing bone and marrow, as the metaphor is. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would be the teacher, that you'd be the one who transcends what we know in the natural and now deliver a, a supernatural message that, that is working as it always is to transform hearts and minds. And, Lord, we've looked at the importance of where we put our focus when it comes to understanding peace. And I thank you for that peace that has fallen upon us now. And I would ask, Lord, that you give insight above and beyond just where we think or understand, but did you give it even deeper for us? And we walk away this morning um, changed because of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. It'd be nice to hear your amens, but um, until such a time, uh, we will be physically distanced for a little while. There is hope in these days that uh, some of the uh, various uh, boundaries that have been placed upon us are going to be lifted and uh, be able to meet. But until that time, we will uh, continue uh, on this kind of a platform and uh, be encouraged through the network that we, that we have. So Colossians 3. The text is about what it's like to live together now as a church when Christ is all and in, in all. But we have to back up to verse 9 and make our way forward. So if we could have those up on the screen, that would be great. Again, in chapter 3, starting in verse 9, we left off last week putting to death all of the sinful things, our old natural self, that which we have died to. And now Paul begins to elaborate on how that affects our regular living. Verse 9 reads, So don't lie to each other. For you've stripped off your old nature and all of its wicked deeds and put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I love that part. What a call. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, and there's the emphasis, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave, free. Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. Christ is all that in all. Verse 12 reads, since God chose you to be a holy people, loved, that he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And so in verse 9, Paul begins to, to paint a picture and uses the example of, of taking off, putting off the old self, taking off those garments, those old garments of your former life, and with all of its practices. And that's exactly what happened at your point of conversion. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you have said, God, I want you to be my Savior. I need you to be my Savior. Savior, Our old, unbelieving self died, and we, in essence, kind of sloughed off. We've taken off like, like a butterfly sloughs off his, his cocoon in the, the new springtime event. And then... Paul begins to take that. If you've taken that off, then you actually need to put something back on. And so he states a positive counterpart to this taking off of the old self. For it says that Christians are to put on our new nature. 
put on a new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So in conversion, that's what happened. You slough up the old self, and then we put on the new self. It's like a garment. And so you see, I've got my, my old Mac jacket here, and it's taking that jacket off and putting on a new robe, a new clothing, if you will, clothed in humility and, and, and uh, allowance for others' faults that we just read about in, in verse 12 and onward. And you put on love. And I got my love in E Town shirt this morning. See the heart in the back? And it's a great example of putting on the new cloth, the new clothing of your righteousness now. And we don't just decide to do this. We can't just make this happen ourselves. That's a very important distinction that Paul relates here. Because verse 12 makes it very clear who was the initiating power behind this new birth, this metamorphosis, the shedding off of the cocoon into new life. And Paul refers to the believers as those who've been chosen by God. So you're chosen, you are holy, and you're loved. Strong emphasis on those three words, chosen, holy, sanctified, set apart, and deeply loved. You are the beloved. And that's a, that's a whole transformation that takes place there, both in what's happened spiritually and also what needs to take place in our everyday walk of life. And the reason we experience this sloughing off of our old self and the putting on a new self was that, that just that God loved us, chose us, set us apart as holy to the Lord. In other words, he took the initiative to do that. He did that. Because in our, in our own unregenerated state, in our own sinful old nature, as Paul writes in Romans, we are dead. Dead is dead. There's no life. You can't just pick it up and hopefully it comes to life or, or try to resuscitate it. It's dead. And so Christ, through God, in Christ, had to make that happen. He quickened us. He livened us so that then we can respond. And as we do... Uh, we become new. God chose us, God sanctified us, and God loved us. Now that's important because God was up to something, as God always is in our lives, isn't he? God's always up to something. He wants to do this. And what he was up to was that in creating this new people in his own image, by his own power, he was destroying or obliterating the distinctions uh, of our old self that we tend to be proud of or boast in. And I think it's very clear, we have to understand what these distinctions are, and Paul depicts some of those in the passages we read. These distinctions that separated us, but they also made us very suspicious and distrustful, distrustful and jealous and puffed up. And so God, what he was up to, his aim here was creating a new people that would stop boasting about their natural distinctions, that which separated them, and to take and, and boast in that which brought them together, Christ, the uniting of Christ. And that's the whole point of verse 11. Now he refers back to verse 12, where the new self has been put on, and that new self is being renewed. Paul says that in the fellowship created by these new people who are chosen, who are holy, who are love, that there's no distinction. There's no barrier between the, the races. And he gives very clearly between a Greek and a Jew, between those who are barbarian and scalian, those who are slave and those who are free. But Christ is all we need. Christ is all in all. Let me elaborate a little bit on this. In other words, Christ, through God is creating a new community out of the people who put off their old self and they put on their new self. And the marks of this new community, chosen, loved, and holy, is first that the people in it stop focusing on the things that separate them. Stop focusing on the distinctions of, of their Greeks and, and their Jews and, and their 
circumcised and uncircumcised. And you see that theme throughout Paul's teaching in the New Testament. It's because the new people in the new community do not brag about their, their ethnic distinctions or their languages or their intellect or their culture or race or homeland or social status. And I don't know about you, but if you've been around, you know, conversations that went like this, and I often am, like, you start meeting new people and you ask them, oh, where, where are you from? And uh, they say, well, I, my background is this, or I come from South America, I'm, I'm of European descent, or I'm from India, or whatever the case is. And uh, you begin to hear a little bit about the background. And sometimes folks take very uh, a great pride in who they are and where they come from. And I'm always like, but we're all Canadian, right? That's true, we're all, like, but we're all Canadian. <laughs> and we want to make these distinctions because we want to set ourselves apart. And we want to be known by these, these distinctions that we are proud of. And in Paul's day, particularly as there was the Jewish community who had come to faith in Jesus Christ, and in the Jewish culture, they saw others as inferior to them. But they were not the chosen. They were not the people of God. And now, through Jesus Christ, he's united all peoples. That there is no more distinction in the natural, but you are uh, take pride in who you are in Christ Jesus. And that's the climax of verse 11. The Christ is all and in all. Christ is all that matters, for he lives in us. So if you ask the question then, if this is the new community, what's the new about the new self of verse 10? What's the new about the new community of new persons? And the answer is just that. For them, Christ is all. Because once you boasted in your culture, once you boasted in your intellect like the Greeks, but now Christ is all. Once we glorified in our tradition and in the religious rigor of our past like the Jews, but now Christ is all. Once we got our strokes because of our, our, our ethnic pedigree, the, our background, but now Christ is all. Once we reveled in not being like those, those barbarians, or in our case, those who are on the other side of the tracks, those shabby Scythians. No, but now Christ is all. And so Paul is attacking beliefs and attitudes of the old self, now take on the new self in this new community and live together under the banner that Christ is all. No more distinction. No more. Because once we struggle to find our significance, once we struggle to find our happiness and our security in what we were in relation to other people, we, we do that all the time and you see it. We do it by, by saying, oh, I have such and such a job. Or I do such and such a thing. Or I own such and such an item. We're Jews, we're Greeks. We're circumcised. We're free. You can hear the arguments. We're Canadian. We're rich. We're smart. We're strong. We're pretty. We're witty. We're cool. But we took that all off, that old self. And we put on the new self. And the core essence of that new self is Christ is all. It's no longer, as Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, it's no longer I who live, that old self, but Christ who lives in me. No matter what the issue is, no matter what activity or idea or the, the school subjects you are involved in, your vocation, it all exists. As Paul portrays so well in chapters 1 and 2, all for, by, and through Christ. It rests on Christ or it rests on nothing. Because Christ is all. So you hear the emphasis here. You, you hear the stress that Paul is placing upon the importance of the sovereignty of who Jesus Christ is. And we have to capture that as well if we want to understand how to live well in community. And so we stress it because we're about to enter into the latter part of chapter 3 and into chapter 4 uh, uh, of messages that follow in, into these the next couple of paragraphs of, of chapter three, and we need to stress 
how important that Christ is all in all in our human relationships so that, that we remain focused upon the new self and not the old self. And we need to stress it because the world doesn't stress it. And we need to make emphasis upon this because we are in the world. And there's a lot of world in us. We need to learn how to, to strip that old self off on a regular basis and take on the newness of the Christ who is in all. And so isn't the flow of here compelling? In verse 9, just to recap, we put off the old self. In verse 10, we put on the new self. And then verse 11, we stop getting our meaning and our, and our strokes by comparing ourselves with others. Why? Because Christ is in all. And which means that the new things about the new self is that Christ is that Christ and not self is all. And what is so precious about the new self is that for the first time in our lives, we can forget ourselves and be swallowed up in Christ. There's a lot of stress about worrying about ourselves. I wonder how, if you could take inventory through your day about how many thoughts that you have towards how you're feeling or your insecurity about this or how you're doing a relationship to to others or how you do in relationship to your spouse or your children, etc. There's a lot that is daunting that can overwhelm us. But in Christ, we can rest in that fact that it's not about self. For the new self and for the new community, Christ then becomes our success, doesn't it? In the natural, it doesn't matter how we perform in that sense. Christ is my success. So it's not about what I can do. But it's about who I am. Christ is our significance. Christ is our fulfillment. Christ becomes our pure satisfaction and our security. Christ is our peace because Christ is our all. That's the new community. That's the new self. And so I want to drive this home in, in application. Because in practical speaking, we know that we, we struggle in this area all the time. How do I let go of my self and bring on Christ to be my all in all? Because it's not enough to just simply say Christ is all. Because if that were enough, then we know that the rest of Colossians would have not have been written. God might have done it that way. He could have created us, our new self, that way so that we're so complete and so perfect that we would always act in purity and love and justice without ever praying or, or reading the Bible and never having to be in process. And I know that you have not made it, that you've not arrived at that point yet. The new self could have been created with such a fixed focus on Christ as all that it would have no need for me as, as a preacher and others to cry out Christ as all and no need to belong to a, a community or a church or small group where you struggle, as we all do, with all sorts of questions. Questions like, how is Christ all when I lose a child or my baby dies? How is Christ our all when I know that my marriage seems to be tottering on the edge of a precipice of destruction? How is Christ my all when I keep on doing those things of which I hate? How is Christ my all when I tremble that God is calling me to leave certain securities and the natural to go and, and serve him in ministry or whatever the case may be? And the new self could have come into being with no need to, to preach or be in community. It could have come, if you will, with its garments in place. But the reality is it didn't. It didn't. Instead, it comes as verse 10 relates, in the process. In the process of being made new. You're becoming what you already are. Loved, chosen, set apart and sanctified. It's a new order to become new, if you will. Christ is all that he might become all in all of us. 
And thank God that we have been and are and will continue to be in process to attain this new identity that is ours. We have it, and now we are to live it out. And that's where Paul puts pen to paper and begins to lay out in the opposite spirit of what we looked at last week of putting away your sinful nature and all the idolatry and lying and anger and 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 uh, and many other things that want to take and sidetrack us away. And then he says, put on the new self. And in verse 12, he says to those who have put on this new self, as those who've been chosen of God, again, your identity there, chosen. Those who are holy, you've been set apart. Nothing that you've done in yourself, but because of the blood of Christ, his death, his resurrection, and our identity in that, we are now made holy and are living that holiness out in our lives. Chosen of God, holy and deeply loved. To put on the garments. You've come to know and experience that Christ is all. Now show how people relate to each other for whom Christ is all. Confirm that Christ is your way all by what you become for others in the community. And what a time in our human history for the church to rise up and show that it is involved as a new community. That its identity is shown in Christ. And because we have an identity in Christ, we don't have to worry about our successes. We don't have to worry about how our distinctions are and all that sort of stuff is shed and put away. That we can serve without any expectation of return. That we can do that and do that well. And so Paul, in, in, in his concluding thoughts on, on this area of his passage as he writes what community life is like when Christ is all. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read it slowly and I want you to hear and get a sense from what God is speaking to you in maybe one or two or more of the areas here that you say, no God, I can. I need to put off the old self and put on the new self in this arena. Verse 12. Since God chose you Again, the emphasis upon that. Since God chose you to be holy and a people that he loves. Again, that three emphasis. Holy, chosen, and loved. Clothe yourselves. And he begins with the first one with tender-hearted mercy. Put that on. How are you doing in that department? Tender-hearted mercy. What's your attitude like towards other people? Those who may look at you the wrong way or say something, how much mercy do you have for that? Oh, God, give us a tender heart would be the prayer for that. And then he goes on, tender heart, mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And the fruits of the Spirit here that he talks about in Galatians as well. How are we doing in the kindness department? Again, ties in with the tender-hearted mercy, being able to give kindness altruistically, not expecting anything back because we don't need anything back. Christ is my all in all. Humility, considering others better than yourselves, considering others before you think about yourselves. To be able to serve in such a capacity, again, in humbleness, gentleness. Is your speech seasoned with grace? Do your words give life or do they take away? To put on the new self. Put off the old. And verse 13 reads, and make allowance for each other's faults. Oh, how we need that, don't we? We know that for ourselves, we need others to make allowance for us because we're not perfect. And in that same spirit, we give allowance to others. Those who, again, may offend you in some way. Because it's not if, it's when an offense will come. We live in a broken world, so it's going to come. How we choose to do and what we choose in that moment is so crucial that it depicts us as life in the new community. Christ all in all. Make allowance for each other's faults. And forgive anyone who offends you. Whoa, wait a second. Forgive anyone? Yes, forgive anyone. And I know forgiveness needs to be a choice more often than it is a feeling. 
And we want to wait for the feelings before we choose to forgive. And it's not that way in the kingdom. The kingdom says, the kingdom way means I choose to forgive regardless because Christ is my all. Christ is my satisfaction. Christ is the one who forgave me first. He regenerated me. He reached out to me. He grabbed me. He loved me. He made me holy. He set me apart. Forgive anyone who offends you because we remember that the Lord forgave us. So you must forgive other people. I love that. And he concludes with verse 14, and I conclude it as well. As we run this home, above all, above everything else, an analogy again, clothe yourselves with love. The so importance of, of that word. Clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And in these days of, of uncertainty in the community of God, there is certainty. There are things that haven't changed. The risen Lord is still risen. He didn't get buried again. He didn't die again. He, he was raised to newness of life. And in that life is fullness and joy overflowing forevermore. And on this side of eternity, on this side of the shortness of and the brevity of life, we have so much opportunity in which to serve and to live out our life in, in this new community, forgiving one another tenderheartedly with mercy and kindness. And so church, rise to the challenge in these days. Practice this readily. And don't worry. We're taken care of, for we are set apart, we are loved, we are being made holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just take a moment to reflect upon this in a song that many of you will know. It's called My All in All. It speaks to the same theme of Christ, you are my all in all. Use this time as a prayer reflective time and ask the spirit to bring to light and be quick to ask for grace.
make you sense a deep and greater understanding of God's intention for us and his intention for the church to grow in grace, not to be overcome by a sense or feeling of I have to do this or I've got to try harder. Now that's why Christ came to abolish that kind of thinking. There's nothing that we can do in and of ourselves, save the grace of Jesus Christ, to live life out in these days. And it's my prayer for you, and I want to invite those who uh, like to come into a prayer room. Um, we have an opportunity to have a couple of prayer rooms to, to join the community, to pray for one another, and to talk about some of these things that, that maybe Christ uh, impressed upon your heart. And uh, we invite you to stay on if you want to like to be a part of that. And uh, there'll be uh, uh, something will pop up on your screen that says join a meeting. You can choose to join or, or whatever. If you need to go, then so be it. I know some of you are coming from uh, different parts of the country and the world and time zones. And there's all sorts of different things that may have to get done. But we want to thank you for taking this hour to be together with the Harborview Church community and to... Uh, to be together. Thanks again for all those who participated, and uh, I just love our church, and I thank you for, for being a part of this. God bless you. I'll read to you a benediction from Romans chapter 11, verse 33 and onwards. Receive this as a gift of grace as you go from this place. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom. And knowledge, how impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a wonderful, grace-filled week as you live out the process of living in new community. Amen. Amen.